Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs reviews the Ag Climatise report and ammonia emissions. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is going to be the last of the Let's Talk Dairy webinars for 2020. Um, I'm going to take a break for next week, a bit of leave to take and so forth. So um, I won't be doing the webinars uh, for the next two weeks. We'll be back again on the 7th of January. So today, just uh, following on from the announcement of the Ag Climatise report yesterday, uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple of items in relation to um, the ammonia emissions abatement that we have to try to achieve over the next number of years. I suppose just uh, maybe time for resolutions in in the month of December uh, running into January and what we can hope to change in order to try and have an impact in relation to this. So I suppose I'm just going to try and summarise the situation, I suppose, in relation to that report yesterday, I suppose the positive thing from it is that it is based on a lot of science that we have uh, developed within Chagas. So Gary Lennigan and other people in Johnstone Castle have uh, contributed to what is known as the ammonia emissions uh, abatement cost curve or the MAC. And um, also in relation to greenhouse gases. And we had a piece there a couple of weeks ago with Katie Starsmore and Ben Hart and Lawrence Schlew in relation to the methane side of things and the greenhouse gas side of things. And we're going to, I suppose, leave that parked for today. Um, obviously, as Lawrence said there, and some of you were aware of it, that there is potential uh, changes to the calculations in relation to methane, which would obviously put us into a, a stronger position than we currently stand um, in relation to methane and ammonia emissions, or methane emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. However, there's no denying that agriculture is very much strongly to the fore when it comes to um, ammonia emissions and we're responsible for well in excess of 90% so the, the gauntlet has been thrown down I suppose in terms of trying to achieve uh, reductions in this area but as I said the, the important thing I suppose is that it's based on science and a lot of it is achievable I suppose the one thing that I would highlight uh, just read it exactly from the report that was released yesterday um, I'm just going to read this summary piece, actually, because I think it's it's worthwhile listening to. So Ireland faces significant challenges to meeting its climate change and air quality targets, as well as biodiversity and water quality targets. This challenge is replicated across all other sectors of the economy, including transport and energy. If Ireland wishes to remain a world leader in the production, management and marketing of low carbon, high quality, sustainable and traceable food, then significant efforts will be required on the whole of government all of sector basis to maximise production efficiency while minimising the effects on the climate and reducing the environmental footprint of agriculture. There is no doubt that Ireland has a fantastic story to tell in the international marketplace. Nevertheless, the rapid expansion of the dairy sector is pushing environmental boundaries in some catchments, including increasing greenhouse gas and ammonia emissions. This needs to be addressed, building on initiatives such as Dairy Sustainability Ireland and the ASA programme. Failure to implement these changes, and this is the important piece in this summary, in my opinion, failure to implement these changes today will mean that more radical corrective action will be necessary later to ensure delivery of our commitments. Scientific research and innovation, uh, the acceleration of the adoption of best practice at farm level and working in partnership across the entire agri-food sector will be a critical success factor in striving towards the vision of climate neutrality. By working together, the sector can ensure its long-term sustainability from an economic, social and environmental perspective, thus safeguarding the Irish family farm for generations to come. So what does that mean for uh, ye as listeners to the call today? So i just open another page here, sorry. So hopefully you should be able to see what's a, a slide that has agricultural measures on it. Uh, and this is the ammonia emissions um, MAC curve. So you can see, you may be familiar with this, but just in case you're not, the way this works is the, the width of the, the option here. So dairy EBI is the one that's been pointed to here. And the width of it in, indicates the, the size of the savings in terms of ammonia emissions. And the depth of it is the cost associated with it. So pretty much anything that has a minus here in fact, everything that has a minus here, so anything that's below the line, in terms of the zero, there's no cost associated with it, with implementing it. Um, 
whereas anything that has is above the line, there's cost associated with it. So we have protected urea here, which you can see is quite a wide bar, but at quite a low height on it. So it, there's a significant impact as a result of using protected urea in terms of ammonia emissions. And there's a slight cost associated with it in terms of its replacement of uh, standard urea. I suppose one of the interesting things to come out of it, for those of you that are, are in derogation, um, uh, you'll be aware or you may be aware that there was an option to uh, ban straight urea um, under the next stage of the derogation regulations. This is after being brought in uh, as of yesterday in the uh, climatized report and uh, straight urea as we know it will not be available from 2024 on. So we're going to have to make the switch to protected urea and I suppose going back to what I just read out there from the report itself, if we don't start to, to make the moves ourselves, um, more draconian um, measures may be forced upon us. So protected urea, if you've been paying attention to the dairy conference and so forth, and a lot of other events in the last number of years, you'll see that Brian McCarthy and Anya Murray have been doing a lot of trialing of the, the products, the product um, NBPT in particular, across several sites. So in Johnstown Castle, it's been used on the commercial farm there. Um, in Ballyhays, Athenroy, Clannacilty and Moor Park, there's plot trials been done by Anya and we're seeing no impact in terms of grass growth in, uh, when compared to straight can and so forth and straight urea. So the, I suppose the point is that we have a big saving to make here in ammonia emissions. We have to start making this very rapidly. Uh, if we don't, there are fines that are going to be imposed on the Irish government and that is going to reflect very badly on agriculture as a result of the fact that we're so responsible for ammonia emissions. Like in many cases, we make the argument that the, or the transport sector is responsible for increasing greenhouse gases, etc. We can't make that assumption or assertion in relation to ammonia emissions. Agriculture has a high, high association with the ammonia emissions for the country. So we have to step up to the plate in relation to this. The other area then that we can see is uh, over to the right here is low emission spreading. So you can see that there is a cost associated with it and I suppose the width of it isn't as significant potentially as, as, as the protected urea. But basically what that is doing is uh, increasing the level of nitrogen that has been retained in slurry as opposed to using splash plate. And this is one of the easy wins, I suppose. Yes, there is a cost associated with, with it. Grants are available for people to avail of to, um, to make their tankers, low emission spreading tankers. I've even seen some which wouldn't uh, require a grant at all, but people have made low emission slurry uh, spreading equipment themselves, wouldn't potentially like to be spreading very thick slurry with it possibly, it might be inclined to block, but basically what you're doing is just trying to apply the, the slurry to the, the ground at ground level, as opposed to sending it up into the air um, which is allowing ammonia to be released. There's a positive, I suppose, from this point of view as well in relation to the, the odor or the, uh, the smell associated with spreading slurry. So low emission spreading uh, is reducing the ammonia emissions, which is the cause of the smell when slurry is spread. So by engaging with low emission slurry spreading, we can also have, a pop, um, I suppose, a positive impact in relation to our neighbors, um, maybe on towns that are close to farms that were, are where farms are close to towns, et cetera, as well. The other big advantage I suppose, and in terms of, um, it, it can be used at any stage during the year, whereas splash plate is, is more, a little bit more tricky in that sense that you're trying to put it onto bare ground. Uh, my colleague, William Burchill, has um, a, a lot of work done or has spoken several times and, and has images available if you look up um, the dairy conference from 20, 20, uh, 2019, which, at which William presented the staining factor or the soiling factor of grass associated with splash plate versus low emissions is obviously uh, very different and low emissions gives a, a very positive impact in terms of the potential to utilize slurry on grazing platforms at a number of stages throughout the year without impacting on grazing uh, which splash plate would. So I suppose the, the, the low emissions is contributing in two, in two ways. It's reducing the ammonia in terms of the uh, emissions that are released on the spreading of the slurry. And the second thing it's doing is that it can potentially offset 
nitrogen usage. So if we if we offset nitrogen usage, uh, we obviously reduce the amount of fertilizer that's used, and this is in relation to this nitrogen use efficiency block here. Um, and by doing that, we obviously reduce the ammonia emissions that are associated with fertilizer uh, utilization anyway. Protected urea won't fully uh, eliminate the ammonia associated with spreading fertilizer, but it will significantly reduce it relative to um, both can and urea. So the, the positive point here is that low emission slurry spreading is a real win-win. Yes, there is a cost associated with it, but uh, over time, the cost can be recouped in terms of um, I suppose better quality slurry and better use of the slurry and this should facilitate a reduction in nitrogen as well. So the important thing here is to, I think from our perspective, there are some small things that we can do in the next, or that we are doing and we just need to continue to do them. And for some people that aren't doing them, um, that they can start to adapt them and, and low emission slurry spreading is one and protected urea is, the, is probably the easiest of all. In a lot of cases, it's a big step to go down the route of um, purchasing a low emission slurry spreader. If contractors in the area don't have them already, it's a big ask. Maybe a lot of people are going to have to start approaching them, looking for them to, in order to get them. However, protected urea is simply a case of just switching one bag to another bag. Um, adjusting the spreader and spreading uh, protected urea instead of can or protected urea instead of straight urea. And as I said, there is a slight cost associated with it when you compare it to straight urea. So obviously for that for early early nitrogen application that we talk about, if you switch to protected urea instead of using straight urea, there is a slight cost associated with it. However, where you're using protected urea to replace uh, calcium ammonium nitrate or can-based fertilizers, uh, currently, and as has been the case for the last couple of years, there isn't an association in terms of, or there isn't a, an increase in cost. If anything, there's generally a reduction in cost. Now, we have made significant strides in the last 12 months in terms of protected urea usage. It's doubled. It sounds great when you hear that we've doubled our usage of protected urea, but in the overall scheme of things, the amount of protected urea that has been sold in Ireland this year is quite small relative to the other forms of, of nitrogen. We can change this very quickly by just uh, in, in informing our co-op people, et cetera, that we're looking for protected urea. And the other thing that I think, and why I'm talking about it today, and as I said, in relation to kind of a, um, New Year's resolutions around what we're going to do to try to improve our environmental footprint, I think we need to sit down in the next couple of days uh, before the, the Christmas is really upon us. Maybe sit, think about what fertilizer we have used. If you're in derogation, it's going to be a good exercise to be doing to get ready to submit your records in the coming year. Um, sit down, look at what, what nitrogen fertilizer you use. Will there be opportunities to replace that with protected urea? So if you're spreading a high amount of can just straight can 27 percent can there is opportunity there to protect to change that to protected urea if you're using a lot of compound because you're working on building soil fertility for a particular reason you may not have the same level of opportunity depending on what you're building so if you're looking for p um p compounds it's not going to be an option to switch to protected urea but if you're looking at n and k or just needing k you can there are options there in relation to that um, so the other thing is to uh, look at the slurry side of things. And as I said, there is an opportunity to, uh, if you're using a contractor and they have low emissions options available, you can ask them to use low emissions. The advantage of this, again, and I refer you to William's um, dairy conference piece last year. And again, it should be something that sh should be common knowledge to you nearly at this stage, because we have been talking about it a good bit in the last number of years. But there's an increase in the nitrogen recovery from slurry as a result of applying it at ground level as opposed to sending it up into the air. So per thousand gallons of slurry that you apply, um, in a normal situation where you're using a splash plate or get re recovering six units per thousand gallons of nitrogen, um, and then, then when it, you move to a low emissions format, you're going to increase that up to nine to ten units. So the advantage of that, I suppose, is um, slurry has to be spread. Many people are beginning to see a bit of pressure coming on uh, facilities in terms of storage and are looking forward to the opening of the close period there after the 13th of January for the Cork area and 
moving out to the 16th of January for, as you go out into Limerick and up into up, up head north and obviously then the people further north have a longer period in terms of, of storage but the the, the situation there is that if we can strategically use our slurry uh, and using it in the spring is a better time because we can recover more nitrogen again from it. Um, so Stan, Stan Lawler would have shown a lot of, uh, done a lot of work uh, back a couple of years ago in relation to this and shown that spring application of slurry was in assisting in, in recovering more of the nitrogen uh, in the slurry also. And then the other aspect of it is that we can actually offset fertilizer then by use of low emissions. As I said, the staining effect of low emission slurry spreading is, is uh, dramatically different to spreading with a splash plate, so we're not necessarily having to look to spread in bare ground. So what we will be advocating is that people will try to use slurry as a form of chemical nitrogen or as a form of nitrogen and, uh, and replace, let it replace their chemical nitrogen application maybe earlier on. Now we will be talking about this a lot more obviously in the new year as we get to that point. But um, just from the point of view that people are probably beginning to make decisions around what fertilizer to buy, I think it was timely to talk about it today. And as I said, discuss it with your merchants, uh, insist that you um, get protect protected urea if you're looking for it. And the other thing is that there is a, a, um, a list, uh, not all protected urea is protected, I suppose is the warning that we have to give to you. So there are different amendments that have been made to the fertilizer in order to um, make them protected. Chagas have a, a list that if you Google, um, it'll identify the, the companies, nearly all the companies now, I think all companies at this stage have a, a legitimate um, protected urea product available so just make sure that you're getting what you're actually looking for um, and as i said make use of it i think uh, the vast majority of people are probably going to be spreading in, in the dairy side of the house anyway are going to be spreading some bit of urea generally in the springtime there is no reason uh, albeit from with the exception that there is a little cost uh, associated with it um, for the spring applications there's no reason that people can't uh, switch to protected urea in a very short space of time and the quicker we do that the, the better it will be in terms of basically it's a very rough calculation that the department use currently for every ton of protected urea fertilizer that comes into the country that's sold they're accounting for that in, in terms of ammonia emissions and the same is true then where we're using straight urea or whether we're using can so if we can reduce the levels of can and, and straight urea and replace that then with protected urea we're going to get a, a gain in terms of the ammonia emission side of things. I suppose around this nitrogen use efficiency, um, again, it would have been discussed at the dairy conference. William would have actually spoken about it with Jimmy Cotter um, back in September, I think, when we were down at Jimmy Cotter's uh, in relation to his nitrogen use efficiency. And Jimmy's nitrogen use efficiency is quite high at 29%. Uh, currently, we're running at around 24, 25% uh, based on Cahill Buckley's work through the National Farm Survey and there is scope for improvement so what it is is basically uh, quantifying the recovery of nitrogen um, from what is going in so nitrogen from fertilizer, nitrogen from slurry, what's being recouped in terms of animal salt out the gate, milk salt out the gate um, and doing the calculation in relation to them then so the surplus of one over the other and then putting a percentage on that by dividing one into the other. So we can improve that by uh, making better use of fertilizer. I think um, making using the slurry to offset some of the chemical nitrogen is going to be a positive in terms of obviously that will reduce the chemical nitrogen usage on the farm. Uh, the slurry is going to be there. It is going to have to be spread. So if we can use that strategically to offset some of our fertili chemical fertilizer usage, uh, it will have a positive effect in terms of both nitrogen use efficiency and uh, ammonia emissions and it won't impact it doesn't have to impact on soil fertility or um, on grass growth sorry the other thing that has been uh, strongly talked about is a liming program and how that is that's also feeding into the nitrogen use efficiency so i suppose depending on where you are in the country um we had a a very wet day here yesterday. I think it, it probably spread across the entire country over the course of the day anyway. Uh, ground conditions are variable depending on where you're located. 
but there is no reason if ground conditions aren't good. And I've seen some people that have availed of it there, in particular in the last week where uh, weather was kind of semi okay. Um, and they have sprayed lime. And lime is what it's doing for you is uh, making your soil fertility better and making that nitrogen use efficiency more efficient by virtue of the fact that you're operating at more of a, a level where you should be. So lime is, is the key point. Again, I'll refer back to Stan's work back in 2013, 2014. Like soil sampling is going on in a lot of farms at the moment. The first step that should be done on the receipt of those soil samples is to look at the lime status and try to address that lime status as quickly as possible. Um, and then after that, you, you go looking to focus your slurry where it's going to be needed. So sending, ideally sending slurry to silage ground for the main, for the most part, um, because that's where the nutrient is going to be coming off in its greatest content. And recycling slurry to that is going to be most efficient way of doing it. And then um, using your chemical fertilizers, so your uh, 18612s or your straight muriate potashes or whatever, to correct any deficits to try to bring yourself to an index tree if you're below that. And that will see a much better response to the nitrogen that you're applying, be it in the form of, of protected urea, or if you're going to stick with your cannon and, and straight urea farms in the short term. So uh, they're probably the main areas that I wanted to focus on here today. It's not going to be a very long session today. Um, I'll just stop sharing the screen here because I have a couple of questions coming in that I can't see. So, um, okay, so Sean McCardle is just asking there, do you think that Chagask and other representative bodies should be pushing for a system that recognizes farmers who adopt these measures and can show that they have the ability to grow grass to support higher stocking rates? At the minute, the current proposals put forward will decimate the small fragmented farms who are using outside blocks for winter feed and young stock rearing. Um, I, I don't know, is that necessarily true, Sean? I know that there was a lot of uh, questions in relation to the Signpost Farm Programme there a couple of weeks ago with the, with the publication of the 3.25 of a stocking rate on milking platforms, which has since been removed. Um, I accept people's points and I would be uh, slightly in agreement that trying to, a stocking rate is, yeah, Setting a national stocking rate would be a tricky thing to do because it obviously varies from farm to farm. The land type, topography, everything comes into it, whether the, a farm has an ability to, to grow grass uh, or not, as, which is the point you're making. I suppose what we have to be very conscious of is that there is probably an upper limit. If you talk to Lawrence Shalou or Brendan Horn, uh, Brendan probably with a very significant environmental hat on now in the last uh, number of years in particular, but has always been looking at the the environmental impacts on of systems work that he's been doing in cartons. There is a tipping point in terms of how far you can push the numbers um, where it's actually economically benefit of benefit to you as a farmer. Now there's always that awkward scenario of uh, in terms of profitability and just actually making money. So I suppose there is a bit of work to be done in relation to that. Um, but I think I think I may, may have even said it to you before, Sean, that I think uh, if we go down a very, we're almost going down a rabbit hole, I think, if we go into the scenario that you're suggesting there and we're going to be put, pitting farmers against one another in one sense. And that may not be the best way. And it, it's also very, very hard to implement. So I think that we have a lot to learn in this area. In the meantime, the simple things that we can do, like the low emission slurry spreading and the protected urea are easy wins that all farmers have more or less, like I think, especially around here, because there's a very high level of derogation in County Cork, we have a multitude of, of uh, low emission slurry spreaders available to us all now in this area because all the contractors have them. There's probably something that maybe could be done there in relation to getting contractors access to the equipment um, to facilitate greater uptake. Um, and then maybe there are other ways or maybe maybe there are innovation might come around that we can make some form of a cheaper uh, application method that's going to be low emissions as well. The, the outside blocks, I suppose, I would think that the important thing there from my perspective would be that the slurry is being sent back to those outside blocks and not being loaded onto a, a milking platform, which is obviously going to contribute to a nutrient loading. So I think that's, uh, 
I, I don't know whether that's really answering your question or not, John, but um, I think at the moment uh, it's very hard to legislate for individuals within a, an entire population. So it's, a, it's going to be a case of a blanket enough kind of uh, recommendations. One of the other recommendations that would have come from the Climatise report yesterday, and again, as I said already, a lot of people would have been talking about um, the scenario around the 170 and being over the 170 in relation to derogation rules. And it was envisaged and it has come to pass basically that uh, that was eventually going to become uh, more or less the regulations that a lot of people were going to be looking at. So like low emission slurry is obviously mandatory under derogation. The objective under our climate is that 90% of slurry will be spread by low emission slurry spreading by the end of 2027. Um, there's also a piece in there that uh, is talking about um, cutting fertilizer actually by 20% as well. So as well as switching to protected urea, there's actually going to be a reduction in the amounts of fertilizer that people can apply. Uh, so we're just going to have to get, I suppose, a lot more savvy maybe with our nitrogen applications. How do we go about that? Again, referring you back to the dairy conference two weeks ago, Jack Nolan, head inspector in the nitrates uh, of the, in the department, put the challenge to people to try to reduce a bag of, of can um, in 2021. It's actually quite achievable, I suppose, if you go back to what I've just been saying there in relation to the the uh, use of the low emission slurry spreading. There early in the season, we can actually eliminate that half bag of can on a proportion of the farm. And there is possibly potential also that you could eliminate the, a full bag of can for that, or full bag of uh, urea actually in that, um, in that period because if you were in a position to follow cows with slurry uh, you could actually offset the, that second uh, 23 units of, of nitrogen as you're going around but again look we're going to we'll be talking about that with groups we'll be talking about it in more detail i'm going to do a webinar in relation to protected urea because there are some concerns out there in relation to its uh, how how well it works and so forth and as i said look we have the research to to back it up but there are some concerns still outside out there um, so I think, as I said, the, there's just one other question here now as well. In, is sulfate of potash a lot better for the environment and the soil than murate of potash when building up K? To be honest, uh, that's a question from Tom Martin. I, I can't actually say, Tom, whether there's a, uh, any benefit. in. I know that sulfate of potash is extremely expensive relative to murate of potash, which is also expensive, and that's probably a lot of the reason why murate is used more so. Um, I, I'll have to come back to you on, on it as to whether it's better for the environment. It's uh, still spreading um, murate or still spreading K no matter what way you go about it. Uh, and there's 42 units generally in sulfate SOP and there's 50 units in your MOP. So um, I wouldn't, I can't, off the top of my head, I wouldn't think that there should would be a major uh, difference. I suppose it's just whether sulfur is required at the time or not. So look, I think uh, just to summarize what I've been talking about, um, and they're coming up to half an hour, I didn't even think I'd be talking for half an hour today. But what I'm suggesting to people this year is, or for the coming year, is that you, if you're not already, if you're not already under the, the auspices of derogation using low emission slurry spreading, or if you're outside of derogation, consider uh, availing of it. It's, it's uh, probably, been seen as just purely a, an, an emissions uh, element, but there is more to it. There is, as I said, there's soil fertility benefits to it because obviously there's P and K in the slurry that you're spreading and being able to utilize it at many stages throughout the year compared to conventional splash plate applied slurry gives it a huge scope for to minimize the amount of chemical fertilizers that have to be used. And that will be a positive in terms of just reducing the total tons of fertilizer of which there's an objective to reduce to 325,000 tons being imported into the country, as opposed to the current high of 408,000 tons that we have been using. And dairy farmers are responsible for using 50% of the fertilizer that's coming into the country. So in, in reality, the, the, um, the, the burden is probably on dairy farmers to respond fastest. And I suppose that's probably the point that you're making, Sean. Uh, in that you're, you are growing grass, you are utilizing your land, maybe is it fair that other people are getting away with uh, similar situations or, or lesser situations 
um, and you're trying to do the devil and all in order to honour these. So I think it's, um, as I said, look, the, the big thing for me is that paragraph that I read out there, and I'll just read it again. Failure to implement changes today will mean that more radical corrective action will be necessary later to deliver, ensure delivery of our commitments. So I think we have a number of opportunities open to us that don't cost a lot of money, are very easy to implement, uh, and are win-win for ourselves in terms of not impacting on our farming systems, uh, and also, and, and if anything, having a positive impact on our farming systems, and also by virtue of the fact that they're impacting on these ammonia emissions in particular. Um, the fertilizer side of things, as I said, it's very straightforward to switch from one to the other. I think, as I said, just looking back through what fertilizer you use this year, are there opportunities to replace some of that uh, can-based fertilizer that you may have used with protected urea? And I suppose, as I said, research is confirming that there is no impact in relation to grass growth. So that should give you confidence to use it. But at the very minimum, you should try some. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll get a positive response from it or you'll get a positive, uh, you will get a positive response from it and it will encourage you to use more into the future. So um, I suppose I'll leave it there. I, uh, as I said, thanks for tuning in throughout the course of the year. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we're going to be back again on the 7th of January with Nolig Heffernan, uh, who was with us last week. And Nolig is going to be talking about the, the yearly planner. So helping you to try and set up your year a little bit better to make sure that you can get uh, full value from your time. And uh, in the meantime, I suppose, take care, stay safe and a happy Christmas to you all. And we'll see you in, the, in 2021. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday. So do listen in then. I'm Emma Louise Coffey and thanks for listening.